So welcome to tonight's program. This is the second program with Joel Third, who will talk about the role of Courier and Eyes in 19th century American mass media. Joel has been an avid collector for almost 40 years. Due to his interest in history, he owns a collection of wonderful Courier and Eyes prints that he has shared with us in many different ways over the years. You know Joel's originally from North The guy that was Ohio. dead was a guy that he went up in the stairs and he was, this guy um, was lecturing these people about. Oh, the... Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> the joys of Zoom. Okay. So back to Joel. Um, Joel's originally from Northeastern Ohio, for those of who, you who do not know him, where he graduated from Case Western Reserve University with a degree in, in, in electrical engineering. He and his late wife, Betty Jane, moved to Ridgefield in 1992. A longtime board member of Keeler Town Museum and History Center, Joel is also on the board of the Rotary Club, Ridgefield Symphony Orchestra, Ridgefield Men's Club, the Graveyard Committee, and is a facilitator at Founders Hall. This is the second in a series of several talks where Joel will share his wonderful collection of historic current eyes prints with us and provide insights into the American psyche of the 19th century. Tonight, Joel will explore the role of women in the 19th century as seen through Courier, Courier and Ives. And I am now going to hand it over to Joel. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm very pleased that we have such a good group here tonight. Uh, as as Hilde has said, I've been collecting the Courier Knives, and some of them are now down at Keeler Tavern, and we'll be talking about that later as to when they'll be available for everybody to see. Um, so with that, we're going to share screen with any luck. There it is. Okay. Hilde, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, here we go. Perfect. Very good. So tonight's topic is really the view of, of women in the 19th century uh, through the lens of Kurt and Ives. Uh, as we will discuss, Kurt and Ives was the, the probably the predominant producers of, of lithographic plates in the 19th century. And they had various topics as we discussed last week. This, first, we're gonna review the, uh, what we talked about last week, which is the foundation of Courier and what, what the whole uh, firm was about. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about lithography, kind of a, some of it, a bit of a repeat, but I actually have a stone here tonight that I'm gonna show you if I can lift it. These things are heavy. And um, then we're gonna talk about Women's rights, which is sort of a, a misnomer. It should be the lack of, but it's not a very good phrase to say that actually, but that's really what it was. And then we're gonna talk about temperance uh, at the, uh, the last part of the, of the uh, performance because <clears throat> women were very involved in that as well. And we'll discuss that. And Hilde's gonna talk a little bit about future programs and so on. So here we go. So America in the 19th century population, uh, you can read the screen, uh, but the, I'll read the, the headlines. Population, urbanization, immigration, and the four, four wars, three, uh, American territory expl uh, literally exploded from the 13 colonies along the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific Ocean in 65 years. And then the industrial development, which was accelerated by the War of 1812, when we sort of discovered that we didn't make anything yet uh, in the country, and it was time to uh, to really accelerate the development of our industry. Now, lithography uh, prints didn't arrive here in America until 1818. Uh, it was faster and, and cheaper system. Um, the application was really mass media since we didn't have other forms of mass media. And mass media was important in that time because uh, some of the people couldn't speak English yet they just arrived and they were learning English. So I'll give them an idea of what was happening. 
Plus, a lot of people had particular interests and the prince really helped. The other interesting thing about the prince, the middle class was developing, especially around the mid 18th, 19th century. And people had homes, which they didn't have before. Uh, they were moving up uh, in the social scale and they needed something in their parlor and their living rooms. So lithographic prints were, were great. Like the print behind me, I don't know if you can see this. This is would be a full size print uh, off from Turner Knives. This is an original print. They, they were off the stone, they were black and white and they had to be hand painted. So all these prints have been hand painted before chroma lithography really was developed. And Courier never really used uh, uh, chroma lithography, maybe a little bit. And the field was dominated by Courier. 95% uh, of the prints in circulation at the peak of the, uh, of the prints was uh, from Courier and Ives. They had 7,000 titles over their 73 year history. And they sold them all over the, uh, really in Europe, in Australia and Canada, and of course, throughout the United States. <clears throat> Lithography was invented by Alois uh, Sennett Elder uh, in 1796. It, it was sort of an accident that he discovered this, and he used it, he was a, an actor, and he used it for preparing scripts and so on for his, his profession. And as I said, it didn't arrive here for 20 years later. This is a, uh, an example of a press. Since uh, the prints were from an actual lithographic stone, and let me see if I can lift this. Oh, man. This is, I don't know how well you can see this. This is an actual small lithographic stone. And it weighs, oh my heavens, 10 pounds. And it's two and a half inches thick. And this one's, uh, I think, eight by 10, something like that. And there are a few drawings on here that are still here. This stone is over 100 years old. And this is a from a manufacturing group in South Carolina that, that used these stones, probably making, uh, probably stationary or something from looking at these little images. So this is a real stone. This is what they look like. And it was a, it was a process that they could make thousands of prints from and it didn't disturb the image. So that was another advantage of the lithography. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the firm itself. This is one of their big logos. This is Nathaniel Courier. This is before Ives joined the group. And again, they, they started in 1834 and they really lasted until 1907. This is uh, Nathaniel, born up in Massachusetts. He was a very, very well ori oriented in, in public taste and marketing, very shrewd fellow. He, plus he, he had a lot of charm and he attracted a lot of the talent. This is Ives, born in New York City in Bellevue. His father actually was a a caretaker or an administrator at uh, Bellevue. And that's where he grew up. And he was actually Charles Courier, who was uh, Nathaniel's brother. Uh, this is his uh, brother-in-law. Now, this is something I really picked up recently. This is an actual letter from Courier and Ives firm to their agents. And I just wanted to point out a few things which summarizes the whole process. These are their titles, and you can read these. The catalog, the catalog comprises in la 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 love scenes. That meant a little something different then than now, actually. Um, kittens and puppies and ladies' heads. That's a strong word, but it really was ladies' portraits, which we'll show you some of those. They did a lot of Catholic uh, religious prints because of the Irish immigration. Then we had patriotic, and as I indicated last week, the nation needed their own history. And that's what one of the things that Courier was providing. In other words, they didn't want to hear about English castles and kings and queens and so on. They wanted these, these new immigrants and the Americans wanted their own history 
And that's what uh, Curry and I uh, tried to provide. They had Vessels Comics. They did a lot of railways and, and the, uh, all the transportation that was developing uh, and fruits and vegetables. So a lot of these could be, the beautiful hand colored prints could be mounted on your wall in your homes. And they were a lot cheaper than say a, a painting of any kind. And as he indicates here, his experience over 30 years uh, enables them to select for publication subjects best adapted to suit the popular taste. This was the basis of the firm. They were extremely good in marketeer. They only made prints that would sell. They weren't terribly, uh, they didn't have much of an editorial bent because they, they would take both sides of an issue, for instance, and so on. Uh, it was what would sell. And then to the peddlers and travelers, this is an interesting thing here. The peddlers were the New York peddlers from the, from the street. They would take the prints in the morning, they would sell them to these guys and they would peddle them uh, on a retail basis uh, throughout the city. And then traveling agents, prints were sent to Europe and they were sold in a similar fashion or in other ways in Europe or in Canada and so on. And that was their reach. And as, as I indicated earlier, the, in time, pictures became a necessity. And at a price which could be retailed so low that everybody could afford to buy them. This was a, a part of their secret of their success. In other words, if you had a home and you wanted a decoration, uh, this is the way to go. And they were also in barns and in bars and all over the place. And the other thing from a, from a business point of view is everything was strictly cash, no checks, no, no credit, cash on the barrel head. So it gives you an idea of the economy at that time. Now here is starting to talk about women's uh, rights. This is a, a, an article which actually Hildy had me really research this. And I found out the author was Barbara Welder from an American Quarterly, and this was published by John Hopkins, and she was a professor at Hunter. And this was her summary of what was happening in antebellum uh, between 1820 uh, and 60, the ideology. And it, read this, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Women were innately weak, passive, emotional, religious, and chaste. Religious doctrine and scientific and medical evidence proved that women were neither theologically or biologically capable of moving into the public sphere. Now that's room for some discussion. And true women exemplified four cardinal virtues, piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. I thought these two words were sort of contradictory, but that, we won't go there. Together they spelled mother, daughter, sister, wife, and woman. Without these virtues, all was, was ashes. With these virtues, she was promised happiness and power within her own sphere, within the confines of her home. I spent some time in Saudi Arabia to divert slightly, and this, this really still applies, having witnessed uh, the the women I did see, that was purely in homes. So I never got into one of the homes because that just wasn't done there. But that's, uh, I only had one occasion where I was even close to a Saudi woman in a restaurant. And they were, of course, speaking Arabic. And I was with a friend who spoke, who spoke Arabic. Later on, I said, what were they talking about? Well, they were talking about their husbands being abused, et cetera, et cetera. So, oh, well. I guess kind of ex expected that. The other thing about Saudi, and it was, this gets to the using humor uh, when, when you're traveling. We were in a meeting with some Saudis and some of our people in, and one of the Saudis popped up and, and said, oh, we're going to, let's, we're thinking about letting women drive. You know, something really new here in the kingdom. And without thinking, I put my hands out and said, Oh, I said, wait a minute, you give that another thought. I said, you know, just having women drive, you want to give that another thought. And it, that joke was a bomb. They, they didn't think it was too funny. So I learned that you have to be a little careful how you deal with these things internationally. 
All right, here's a Courier Knives showing, depicting a woman in her sphere. And it was also used for intemperance. But it shows her domestic control of the children, husband just coming home from some labor, job of labor, right? He was probably an industrialist out here from looking through the window. And this beautiful house. He didn't need a Courier Knives. He probably had a real painting up here. This was the other thing. Courier Knives was very uh, idealistic in the sense that they didn't depict any real poverty or any of the ills that, that was occurring in the society. So women's legal rights. They were, the American history was dominated by English common law, basis of marriage and pro, uh, property rule. These laws were called coverture, which really essentially means a covering, legal covering. Stipulated a married woman did not have a separate legal existence from her husband. In other words, he controlled everything. She had no real legal authority of her own. The, the married woman was totally dependent. She couldn't own property and she couldn't even keep her own wages if she was employed. He had control over that. She was unable to sue or sign contracts on her own, but her husband did didn't have to, but he did often ask her to sell her property, to obtain her consent before selling any property that she had inherited. Now, I thought that was a real, uh, real kudo for the, to give the lady a little something. Now, the right struggle, uh, in summary, started uh, before the Civil War, the antebellum America, and strengthened greatly after but it still took a long time. Curry and I's portrayal of women was mostly to support the family as we saw in that print and husbands and portraits of young women. Now, most of the portraits were of men, but there were about 25% were of young women. Curry and I's ridiculed the suffrage movement and I will show you some of the comics but not many, just a few, and they're not obtainable. I tried to find those prints as a collector and I was unable to, but I, I have pictures of them, of, of how they belittled uh, this, the movement. At the same time, the, the two of our territories at the time, Wyoming and Utah had actually granted women's suffrage. And that was for political reasons. Apparently they didn't have enough votes for whatever they were doing. And they actually got the rights of women to vote in these province or these territories <clears throat> and another group developed the philanthropic educational organization the PEO which uh, I know uh, some of the women in town belong to and I've given talks at uh, two or three of their their groups and they promote women's education they started in, in 1869 which is pretty early and they um, provide scholarships and support for women going on to college. And then of course the, in, in the 19th Amendment in, in 1920 was passed and then the League of Women Voters was founded in Chicago that same year and that's a prominent uh, women's organization and we have a, a, a strong group here in town as well. Now what well, women's education Private colleges for women, it was started by Vassar and not till 1865. Because some of the pushback that Vassar, Vassar was the gentleman who actually founded the college because he said, well, if women are essentially feeble-minded, why, why bother with the college? So we had to fight some of those issues and get the uh, college going for, uh, for women. And then Smith and Wesley, uh, Wellesley, I'm sorry, started in, in 75. But I just pointed out here that Vass, even Vassar was 182 years late because Harvard was established in 1638, but no women were allowed. The land grant colleges in the Midwest with the funding from the Morrill Act began in 62 and they were admitting women in their schools and university. In Connecticut, uh, UConn uh, at that time was renamed the Stores Agricultural College. This was one of their intermediate names before they really became Yukon in, in 93, and they were admitting women, but not till 93. 
Now, here's the kicker. Yale did not become co-ed until 1969. That really surprised me. I, I didn't realize it took them so long. And then by 1872, 97 colleges had actually admitted women. By eight, uh, 1880, 33% of all higher education students were women. Uh, and today that number is 57% in, in uh, 17. So it, it, it certainly grew, but it, it sure took a long time. These are sort of some interesting prints and we have copies of these in our, in our collect, not copies, we have, we have some of these prints in our collection. And um, this is the stages of Van's life. And I have, the, here's the print we have in the collection. And I just wanted to read to you a couple, you can't, read this for yourself because it's too uh, too small. But they have these animals underneath all these men as you go along here. I'll just read you a couple of these. I like this one is uh, when you're 30, you're a bull. Let's see if I can read this. With bull-like strength to to uh, subjugate foes. At 30, to the field he goes. <laughs> and then the next one, at 40, the language is really strange. In, it, uh, at 40, not his um, courage, not his courage failed, but lion-like for force prevails. And then we'll jump here to, well, the guy at the top at uh, 50, here at the peak, strength, uh, strength fails at 50, but with wit and fox-like endeavors, he helps to manage it. That's interesting. And at 60, he goes for wealth. He's stealthy like a fox, or like a, a wolf, actually. No, I'm sorry, that's a fox. The wolf was the guy at 50, and so on. So that's the kind of uh, information they were putting out in the prints. Now, here's the one of women. And there's a slight contrast. There was one purpose. I don't know where these, these marks came from. Anyhow, um, the whole effort of womanhood is to start as a little girl. You learn about dolls and domestic work. You look pretty so you can get married. And then your job is to raise your son. They don't even, that's what this says down there. They don't even mention raising girls. It's all about raising the boy. And, and so on. And then you notice you switch to black at, uh, what is this, 50? And then it's sort of downhill. But it's all focused on raising children and taking care of your husband. Here is some of those uh, ladies' heads that they mentioned. Idealized and, and anonymous. You know, it looks like they're really into uh, into hairstyles. Reminds me of Tammy Faye or somebody. This girl is from the Scottish Highlands. It's probably from some of the, the immigrants. And this is the only one that portrays uh, an African-American and it's called the, the Colored Beauty. That's the only one that they produced for women of color. We have some of these in the collection. Again, a woman's place, taking care of her husband. This happens to be George McCullen, who is, took over the, uh, the uh, Army of the Republic, or the uh, what they call his army. Anyway, it was during the Civil War. And this is the brave wife who's looking after her husband and the kid crying over here. So it's again, all her position in a home.
And of course, men were out to protect the women. So when the fire breaks out, the, the, the firemen would rush in and make sure the women were okay. Apparently the place is really burning here. Now this drawing was on stone from uh, Lewis Maurer, who was one of the, we talked about him last week, was one of their best artists. And he drew right on stone. Now what that means is, I, I don't want to pick this thing up again, but you draw right on that stone, backwards, the image. There wasn't an intermediate print. And then after they were made, they're made in black and white, they were painted. And this particular one, he did a series of the fire departments and volunteer firemen in, in 58, 1858. Now, here's another series. This is a single life that men could uh, experience. Doesn't look like he's doing terribly well. And again, this is the only time I saw the prints where they showed uh, probably a working class environment is in the home. Most of the other prints, the, the homes were really upper middle class or probably industrialists. So they didn't really focus on any poverty or any, any areas where there were any social concerns. And of course, his whole situation changed when he found a, a nice wife that could take care of him over here. We have both of these prints in the collection. And this was, both of them were undated. So that was probably mid, maybe mid-century. Now, there were three women who um, really, promoted women's rights and later on temperance. And I won't go into a lot of detail. There's a lot of detail here, but this is uh, Elizabeth Hayes Stanton. Um, she came from a family, her father was a lawyer and she always was very interested in, in getting into more of an intellectual and male and male spheres. She did go to a college, the first uh, female seminary and first institution that provided women with, with college, uh, well, maybe almost college education. I don't know how good this school really was. And with uh, uh, Lucretia Mott, who we'll talk about in a second, advised and helped Stanton organize the famous uh, Seneca Falls Convention in, uh, in New York, in Seneca Falls in 1848. This is where they put out the Declaration of, of Sentiments. And there they listed all the, the problems that they were having with the legal, not if they've got divorced, they couldn't even keep their kids. They couldn't control their own property and on and on and on. They had a whole list of grievances essentially. And this was really the beginning of, of the, the movement. And they realized that in order to get anything done, they were gonna to have to have the vote. So this has really got the women's suffrage unit going. But again, they didn't establish that in New York until 69, Stanton and, uh, and Mott, but they really got the ball rolling in, in the way of women's rights in that century. And again, it was after, didn't really get going until after the Civil War. And here's uh, feminist ab abolitionist, Lucretia Mott, and she's again with the Seneca Falls Convention and the Declaration of Sentiments. And she got very involved as an abolitionist. But, uh, she uh, worked in, 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 in all sorts of anti-slavery activity. And the, the interesting thing about Mott, when they were at Seneca Falls Convention, the second day, I believe, it was a mixed group. Uh, and there were men in the audience and everything. So her, she could not lead the group. It had to be her husband got up to lead the group because it wasn't fashionable. Or it wasn't permitted really to have a, a female lead in a mixed crowd. So Mr. Mott took over the, uh, the group so they could proceed. Can you imagine the... Uh, difficulties that these women went through. She went to, uh, attended the World's Anti-Slavery Convention in London, 
And her and the rest of the six or so American women delegates were excluded from participating. They were in the in the room, but they they were they weren't permitted to say anything, and they were pushed off to the side. The organizers in London were afraid that women's rights activity in the U.S. would disrupt their strategy of, of anti-slavery. The other woman who's probably you've probably heard of is Susan B. Anthony. She was big in women's rights and then later in temperance. Um, Susan was raised as a Quaker and so was uh, Mott. She moved to Rochester and became involved with Frederick Dull uh, Douglass. So she was really big in, in uh, abolition activities as well. And she was able to find a school where she became a teacher. Her big drive, um, well, actually Mott really got involved in women's rights when in her college she became a teacher and found out the men were making a lot more money than the women. And that really got to her. So she really got on, on, on board with women's rights. And Susan also attended uh, some anti-slavery conference. And there's where she met uh, Elizabeth Stanton and they worked together for the rest of the century in women's in New York state and other places. And she was, and uh, now we're switching a little to temperance activity. There was a group formed in Boston called the American Temperance Society. And I'll talk about it in a, in a second. But women were excluded from speaking at this organization on, on temperance. It was an all men's operation. Then she realized again, that for women to be taken seriously, the, the right to vote and own her own property was really essential. Here's these cartoons I was talking about. This is called The Age of Brass. Susan Sharp Tongue Man Tamer. So here she is depicted as uh, not fully dressed, apparently. I'm not familiar with the clothing of the 19th century. Smoking. They're trying to vote over here. And this woman is stroking a cigar. And here the poor guy is over here with the kid while his wife is probably going to go vote. So this was considered really a, a real problem. So this is the kind of cartoon that uh, Curry and Ives would have produced. And again, not many of these. And this was in 1869 after the, the movement was picking up some steam. Now the other one was this one called The Age of, I guess I can't even read this one. I, I got something up here that I can't read the, uh... anyhow, this is how, what the man expects to be. In other words, here's, here's the men. They, they're now doing the laundry, taking care of the kids while the women are going off shopping or whatever they're doing over here in a nice coach. This is one of the other cartoons that was made in 69. The bloomer became popular. And this was a, a, a butt of jokes, especially in the male society. A woman by the name of Elizabeth Miller was a feminist and really got disgusted with wearing long skirts and all the rest of it while, while trying to garden. So she started wearing Turkish trousers with a skirt. And essentially the first one to wear bloomers. Now this, uh, was publicized by a woman by the name of the Bloomer, who owned a newspaper, first to own her own newspaper for, for women in 49. And that's why it was called the Lily. And so the, the name Bloomer came from her promotion of that. And this is Courier's depiction of the Bloomer. 
which was very popular for a while. At least it was the butt of jokes for a long time. Now, during the Civil War, this was a battle of uh, Antietam, which um, I'm just showing this because of the next slide. Courier did a lot of these promotional pictures of the Civil War, and obviously they were all favored by Union soldiers. Usually the, the Union was the only one that had colored uniforms and the, the South of the Confederates were usually depicted as uh, gray and, and practically invisible. Anyhow, what came out of the Civil War was the first American recognition of nurses in battle. Before that, women around the troops or in battlefield were known as hookers from General Hooker. And it wasn't until the Civil War when they began to realize that women could play a great role in, in looking after the wounded soldiers. So this was a milestone in the development of women's rights and understanding. Here shows the guy out on the battlefield. Now temperance. Uh, the question is, was temperance uh, an overstated or reaction to excess consumption? Remnant of pure. Well, most would in 1819 or 1810, there were 14,000 distilleries for a population of 7 million in this country. The average alcohol consumption was seven gallons per capita in 1830. Now, if you've been to any of our tavern tastings, you know that uh, cider was very popular. Why? Because the water was uh, in many ways contaminated and so on. And today we consume per capita consumption is about 2.4 gallons in 2020. So there's quite a difference here, about three to one. So that drove the, uh, the, uh, the temperance movement. Now the first social movement in the country, it was to mobilize for specific cause was the American Temperature Society that I mentioned called ATS and it was founded in Boston in 26 by men. But women led the way from then on, became involved with temperance because they and their children were often victims of men. That led to the formation in 1873 of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And when I was eight years old, I think I've told some of you this, I had to sign the pledge. They had a woman in Ohio and had me sign the pledge. And I don't know, I must have lost it somewhere along the line. I, still, I don't have it anymore. Anyhow, I think there, there are still some in, people involved in this organization. I know it was prevalent back in the 50s, 40s and 50s. Now, has made a series of pro-temperance prints, while at the same time, we're printing beer advertisements. So again, as I said, they didn't have a real policy. They, they had a marketing policy. Here's some of their ads. They worked, did some things for Jack Daniels, Bush, and Kentucky Tavern, which is a bourbon. And Courier's even mentioned here as the, the style of the drum. But I, I read this and I realized this was a, a temperance ad. Last week, I, I started my rum diet. And so far, I've lost three days. So it's, it's rather subtle. I thought it was kind of funny. But it, it actually, believe it or not, first, I thought it was an ad for rum. And I realized it was really the opposite. Southern Comfort. I have a bottle of this down still unopened. Courier did a collection called Home in the Mississippi from 1871. This was after the war. And there's a lot in these, the riverboats, the beautiful house, 
the white uh, occupants of the area down on the Mississippi. And of course, the only blacks in the area were down here. They probably weren't even from up here on the road and very society oriented and so on. But this print was used on the label of Southern Comfort of this particular variety for 3.5 million images in the last hundred. So that was it. probably the most used uh, courier print ever. Here's an interesting thing. This happened at Francis Tavern. Get, uh, we're doing some work with Francis Tavern uh, on their uh, tavern nights. This is George in uh, 1783, saying goodbye to his sons after the revolution. This is the same year that the Paris Treaty was signed. So they're celebrating. And here's all the, the prominent generals that were involved, von Steuben, Knox, Washington, Clinton, and Hamilton is here. And they're all, they're drinking sherry, the craft and the glass. Now, guess what happened uh, a couple of years later, 1876, same print, but the glasses are missing. The craft is missing and it's a hat. This is really what we would call today alternate facts or fake news or whatever. So it's not a brand new phenomenon. <laughs> Courier was using it back in the 19th century. Yeah, 19th century. So all the alcohol is gone. And no, George no. is still here with all these generals. No. No. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Um, the internet is cutting in and out from you. So we, we're we just now seeing the first um, slide with General Washington. Um, somehow there oh, was- Oh, okay. A... Well, let me, let me go back. So no use- Here, Here's say. that first slide. Yeah, I think Joel, maybe turn off your camera they... a little bit. Joel, turn off your camera because the slide will still be- Okay, short. hold on. Uh, let me turn my camera off. Uh, wait a minute, I screwed up. Sorry about that. I this. have to oh, stop it. sharing. Oh, you can. I'm going to turn my camera off. There we go. Peregrine. Sorry about this. I'm sorry, this people. Yeah. Now, can you see this print? It might take a few seconds. Yeah, it takes a while to load. Is it coming up? No, not yet. Let me check. Here we go. Okay. Okay, now we see it. So okay. One with the hat. Now you saw the first print with the, the bottle of the uh, carafe of sherry and so on. Not so really, no. You didn't see that print? No, if you go back, here we go. Yeah, go back. This is really annoying. That's just the internet is, is sort of- Is not. acting up here, yes. I had trouble this afternoon. Now, can you see this print with the sherry? Yes, now, yes. Okay. Good. This is at Francis Tavern, 1783. George was having a, a goodwill, a good, uh, a party for a farewell party for his troop for his uh, officers now this is in 1876 is that coming up yes the bottle's missing the craft is no longer here the glasses are all gone so this is really an example of alternate facts or fake news so it's not a new phenomenon Courier actually used it. And this was to satisfy the, uh, the temperance. Now, this is a, another series of prints and we may wait a second to shows up. They uh, the next prints of the failure of uh, what would happen if, um, it's telling me that 
the uh, the connection is unstable. Can you see this, Hildy? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Just keep going, Joel. Okay. This is this is print five of the six. I don't have all of them, and this is a the the husband is laying here probably inebriated with one kids, and there's another kid here, and she's home and she's pregnant. Expect wife. And these, they had a whole series about what happens when the men drink too much. And this is a one that shows when things really got bad. The family has lost their home. They're really street people. In this case, it's not much of a street, but can you see this one? So we're still no, seeing the one progress of intemperance. Here we go. Yeah. Now no, this is another print they did in 1870. It shows a family that's really destitute, probably due to alcohol. Now we're switching to a print called the fruits of temperance. In other words, if you, if you did not drink and you were trying to lead a straight life here, it was wonderful. And this is, it said, behold the son of temperance. This man is returning home. Looks like he's a real laborer, obviously, from the factory, he probably owns the place. And his wife is here waiting for him with a big smile and the kids are all joyous. And again, the woman is promoted as only being in her sphere here. This is another one of fruits depicting a woman in her sphere, but also the fruits of, in, of temperance, where it's a very happy family, beautiful home, etc. Now we saw this print before. Now this is one I want to talk about a little bit. This is uh, one of those up and down prints that they did, but this has to do with uh, getting men getting becoming alcoholics can you see this one yes joel yeah okay good starts off with just one drink and then a, a glass with the young lady here to keep warm and then you get a little inebriated here and then you're always drinking with your friends and then things really change and you're in, you're in poverty and you're really um, forsaken by your friends. You, you devote your life now to robbery to get enough money to drink. He's, he's doing a, uh, he's holding up this guy. And then at the end, you commit suicide. So this is what happens to you if you start to drink. It only takes one to start. And of course, the poor woman here is suffering in the child because of your drinking problem. Now, um, one of the real proponents of uh, temperance from the women was a woman by the name of Carrie Nation, who you might have heard of. She was, she was involved in uh, Missouri and Kentucky. She, um, she took things seriously. She took, she had an ax. She started out with stones and her husband suggested she use an ax. So she thought that was a good idea. In fact, she said that was the best idea he ever had in her marriage. So he, she picked up an ax. And because God had, uh, she had revelations from God, she became more radical and really, uh, started smashing up bars, furniture, stock, the whole thing. She was arrested 32 times and kept coming back to her mission. So here's the Courier and I's depiction of her as Joan of Arc, tearing up a bar, poor bartender, 
and the, the booze is scattered all over. So she's really doing a number on these uh, these bars. So that's the uh, real story. Um, here's some references. If you ever want any of the references or get this list, just contact the museum. The one that we use a lot is this one here by Lebeau, uh, Brian Lebeau, Courier Knives as America is Imagined. And it's a very good book. And it's not just the pictures, but it's the actual, oh, you can't see this, what am I doing? Um, it does a lot of uh, editorializing and, and putting it in perspective. He's a professor in, in Iowa and he's written a, a wonderful book and it was published by uh, Smithsonian. So, uh, let me see if there's any questions. This is a, a by the way, this is this print is is a large print. It was one of the classics of Courier and I was showing a middle class up in Central Park. This print is so detailed that a lot of people use this to portray the uh, the clothing that the men and women were wearing in the middle of the 19th century. So, any questions? Um, do you want to stop sharing, Joel? Yes, yes, screen? good idea. Then you can start turn on your camera again. Yeah, I'm sorry. This 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 connection was not good. No, I muted myself. That's not good. There okay. Go. Okay. So I'm just asking for questions. So far, we don't have any questions yet. Sorry about all the technical difficulties. Joe? Yes. I have a print that only lists Mr. Courier. Was yes. that common? until about um i think the date was 1856 when ives joined the group so oh, okay. courier started in 34 so yes you would have prints that just say nathaniel courier or nc yeah. okay answered my question it's the same mr courier yes without yes <laughs> that's it so so yeah. i have a question here from now they're coming in that's great from marjorie Marjorie's asking, did the intemperance prints sell well? Oh, very well. Yes, it was a very successful firm. As I said, they had uh, 7,000 different titles and they, they literally produced millions of prints <clears throat> through the 74 years. Unfortunately, the best selling print was the one who who belittled the African-Americans, the, the series which we'll be doing sometime later <clears throat> called the Darktown series, that was the best selling. And they sold hundreds of thousands of copies of these prints. And it was pitiful the way they depicted the African-Americans. So yes, they did sell a lot of prints. <clears throat> and the beauty of lithography was you could make a lot of prints and you could store the stone and then bring the stone back out and start making prints again. Uh, it, it was a very, uh, from that point of view, except, as I said, the big stones for prints like the one behind me weighed about 500 pounds. So it wasn't an easy thing to set up, but it was very practical from a point of view, <clears throat> logistics and publication. I have another question from Suzanne. Um, she's asking, but it seems they never supported women's suffrage. Did they turn after women gained the vote? No. No, nope. because by the time uh, it, Courier and Eyes were both dead by the time the, their kids had taken over the firm by the late eight, uh, 19th century. And no, they never really supported uh, suffrage in their prints that I was aware of. Only they, they just belittled it with those, but only a few of those. So again, they were playing that one close to the vest. They were, very, as I said, they were very conscious of the public's uh, interest because that's that's who we're buying all their prints 
They didn't want to upset anybody. So unfortunately, no, they did not support suffrage. And another question from Kathy. Of all the prints you own, do you have a favorite? Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> well, one of my favorites is this one behind me of the some of the old paddle wheelers on the Mississippi. That's a good print. Um, there's probably others, Kathy, but uh, that's really my favorite. I have another one over here of a, of a steam, one of the old steam vessels on the Mississippi stopping and, and loading up with wood. And that's a very good one. Okay, and then I have a question from Daniel. He's asking, where would you recommend finding some original prints to collect? Well, the auction houses, there's places like the old print shop uh, down on, um, down there 30th Street on, jeez, uh, it's a main North Street, Northwest, North South Street in Manhattan, right next to Park Avenue. What the heck, uh, slipped my mind. But uh, no, there are, there are shops they tend to be sometimes a little expensive. There's dealers now on the internet. Uh, the Philadelphia print shop, they have two locations, one near Philadelphia and the other in uh, out in Denver. They have a selection of prints and you can find them on the internet. Plus a lot of auctions end up with uh, couriers. Uh, the, some even some auctions around here. And sometimes there's only one or two in an auction. So they're still available. And they, they vary in price from popularity and, and, and how, how many were made. And again, the questions are always asked, how many were made? They really don't know. They have no idea how many prints were made or how many still exist. They, they still exist because the paper was so good. They always used high quality paper, mostly rag paper and very good inks, probably uh, watercolors and so on from uh, places like from Austria. And that's why they've held up so well. But again, if it's exposed to too much light or bad conditions, they do, it tends to weaken the print. And Joel, can you just explain one more time how they so how how these prints were sold? They had they had their vendors or salespeople? Yes, they had street vendors like the vegetables in Manhattan, right from the carts. They would have some prints. They would stop by Curry and I's location in, in down in Lower, Lower Manhattan. Uh, and they would actually uh, buy some prints, put them in the wagon and take off. And uh, they would be sold to them at, at wholesale prices. And then they could mark them up as they wished to sell them in the neighborhoods. And then prints were also given to people shipped to Europe, to dealers in Europe and Australia and other in Canada and so on. So they had quite a, uh, an operation going. So that's how they got to the public. The small prints were all done by uh, the immigrant uh, women uh, in mass production around the table. They would do a master print, put it in the center. And then each woman would be a different color and just pass the print around and shoot paint blue, red, whatever. And they had a woman at the end of the table who would be the quality uh, checker. And if it worked, and then the print went out, and if it wasn't, they'd have to start over, or some of the prints are not all that well colored, the small ones. The big ones are given to actual artists in Greenwich Village of all places uh, for a few dollars. And they would paint them up very, very nicely. And that's why the bigger prints uh, have a lot more appeal. And of course, they're more expensive. So I have one more question from Miriam. Miriam is asking, the Travelers Insurance Company used to print calendars with Curry and I seen and mail them to the, to the insurers at Christmas. Are those collectibles now? Uh, yes, but not um, because there's millions of those. They were, they're still making them actually. Um, they're making copies of the couriers. So they do have some value, but it's it's not very much actually, because they are uh, just uh, reproductions. 
But uh, no, some of them are very good quality, by the way. They, they do a good job of reproducing them. Okay. Any other questions? No, I think, does anybody else have a last question for Joel? Um, yes, one more, Suzanne. Um, I have a collection of folios. I have a collection in folio that some, that some magazine made available to their subscribers. They're about 14 by 20. Are they of any value? Sometimes they have some value. Again, it depends uh, on how, the quality of them. Um, once in a while I see them uh, at auction, but again, their value is, doesn't compare to the actual prints. Just to the you know the nature of it, but some of them are very good quality, as far as that's concerned. Haley, you were going to mention something about what our future looks like in these programs. Yeah, so um, Joel has mentioned some of the other themes you know that he has collected with his current ice prints. So we're planning on doing one on transportation, um, and that seems to be Joel's favorite topic too. So um, we'll be doing a couple more in this series. And then I wanted to uh, mention next week on Tuesday, we're doing a curator's corner to do a virtual unveiling of the portraits that have been restored. Um, and the funding came through last year's Giving Day. So it's, uh, for those of you who have participated in the past, Giving Day is Fairfield County's Community Foundation a 24 hour online giving opportunity. And we have always been very, very um, uh, successful with the wonderful support that mm, and a lot of you have given us in restoring items from our collection. So um, if you attend next Tuesday, that's actually gonna be an unveiling of last year's project, the restoration of four portraits. And then we're gonna announce um, the current project, which Giving day is going to be next Thursday. So those are the two dates for next week. But we're also going to send out an e-blast. So you're going to see it all in there too. But yeah. just in case. Thank you, Hildy. Oh, by the way, that the the shop where you should really visit if you're interested in original prints and maps and Audubons is the old print shop. They're 100 and some odd years old. They're on Lexington Avenue down near 30th. And that's, uh, that's a, a place you just have to visit. It's... In fact, uh, last week I showed a picture of Roosevelt. FDR was actually in there buying prints. And I recognized the room that it was in. I, I've been in that place a few times. But it's, it's, a, it's a great old store and they act just like the, uh, the furniture. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Okay, great. Well, if there are no more questions, um, we hope you enjoyed this program. Sorry again about the technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, including my Apple earbuds, which I think they were interfering with the sound the audio. So, and then also there, they, some of you might have noticed the, the blue scribble on the yeah, what is? Show. So we'll figure out if somebody yeah, what, was hacking us. Where did that come from? So, um, there's never, you know, there's always a surprise with all our virtual Zoom based um, presentations, but, um, you know, on we go, onwards we go, and we thank you for your support, and hopefully we'll see you soon again, and everybody, you have a good night, thank you. Yes, thanks everybody.